Now, something you said rang a bell, uh, because Tom mentioned something, too. You said it's a chronic disease, and you're never going to get cured. And yet, there's a time limit on bisphosphonates. People stop them. They stop prescribing them after, what, five years? You stop it? Tip I mean, tip typically five years. Uh, so even in the, the, the FDA's language, is the optimal duration of treatment of bisphosphonate therapy is unknown. Okay, so you stop the bisphosphonates, the practitioner, after five years, year six, yeah. boom, fracture, now what? Well, it, I mean, if somebody <clears throat> fractures, we've, we're probably, number, number one, going to make sure that there's not some reason that we can modify biochemically. Does that patient have hyperparathyroidism? Do they have hyperthyroidism in excess that could be treated? Uh, it, it, are they profoundly vitamin D deficient? Do they have celiac disease? Uh, we make sure that's the case. Uh, if we rule that out, we're going to probably you know, move to something else. So there was a consensus can another consensus panel, but these were very, very good people who looked at the bisphosphonate data. The bisphosphonates are tremendous as a class of medicine. They, across the board, reduce risk of fracture, if you take them correctly, 40 to 50 percent across most that's skeletal sites. Number that's really good. Yeah. The problem is for the more severe patients like this one, it's not enough, and we've got to go to something else. So if we're going to go to something else, uh, do we go to uh, an anabolic drug? Uh, and there are some reasons we might and some reasons we wouldn't. Uh, would we use a, a drug called denosumab, a, a rankle inhibitor, or would we consider using uh, this new class, uh, this antisclerosis yeah, medicine? We're going to get to that, but now, let me ask a simple question. Why not just restart the bisphosphonates? Uh, or do you not do that? Because I think in that case, we're going we're gonna to expose a patient to some unusual, very, very unlikely event, and it's not the right drug. What's the event? I, I knew you were going to ask that. Basically, bisphosphonates stun osteoclasts, but we don't want to put them to sleep. Osteoclasts really cause bone to be reformed, and they really uh, repair the micro damage. Now, our drugs are really, really pretty safe. In exceptional circumstances, and by reasons other than drug, sometimes we see unusual fractures, okay? So in a patient who's been on a bisphosphonate and has fractured or multiply fractured, that's typically a patient I think most of us are gonna use an anabolic agent or okay. consider one of But you were talking about drugs. the patient fracturing once they've been off therapy. Yeah, you stop bisphosphonates, yeah. right. you fracture, restart the bisphosphonate or not? You could. I, I want to come back to something that I think is really important that we talked about, and it, it's often um, a misperception out there. There is not an absolute limit, right? There's nowhere that it is written that after five years, one must stop bisphosphonates. The guidance is really, you want to relook at the patient. After this five years of treatment, and that was somewhat arbitrary based on some of the data we had, limited data, albeit, um, if the patient at that point has been fracture-free, bone density may be a somewhat better, risk is okay, because bisphosphonates have a really long terminal half-life and stay around in the bone. So even after you stop giving them, they're sort of like the gift that keeps on giving, they're still there. Um, you may be able to take somebody off and still have some of those residual benefits, not because they don't work, but to reduce the risk of rare okay. events. But in high-risk patients, the, some of the task force guidance from the ASBMR task force was in high-risk patients, you might continue the bisphosphonate for 10 years. Okay. The key message is there isn't an absolute that's right for every patient. We have to look at it on an individual basis. All right, now, from a payer perspective, what do you hear? You're not following the guidelines, we're not gonna reimburse, or are they a little more open? What are you guys hearing? Well, I mean, I, I mean, I think payers. Uh, I mean, the bisphosphonates are the standard of therapy initially uh, for many patients. Uh, I think they want to see that that's been tried, or if they've had trouble, or the severity of the problem. I think if payers see the severity of the problem and you document that today, uh, I think they're willing, uh, you know, to 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 allow mm -hmm. within reason. So, but you've you know, got to ask for an what, override. Absolutely. What I what I. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I would go ahead. say I, the, the feedback we hear a lot from patients specifically is that they and their doctor might want to try a specific, want to, them to go on a specific drug, and they cannot get that, that drug. So and money's so, playing a role. That's right. 
All right. That's right. I knew you were going to say that. Yeah. You say, do they say you're not following the guidelines? Part yep. of the problem is there are multiple guidelines for osteoporosis out right. there, and they don't all say the same thing in terms of which therapies to start with. So I'm not sure the payers know which guideline to look at, nor do providers.